abnormal psychology. In this lecture, we're going to talk about schizophrenia. Probably one of the most uh, fascinating or intriguing disorders uh, among the mental health disorders. Uh, and I say fascinating in that there seems to be such a break uh, from reality with this group of disorders, and more so oftentimes than what we see in all of the other disorders. For example, uh, depression is a very common disorder, and even if you yourself haven't experienced a major depressive episode, uh, you may have experienced some uh, feelings of depression or sadness at some points of your life. And so it's easy to understand uh, or easier to understand what that might be like. Similarly, we all get anxious about things, and so it's easier to understand what the next step might be to actually have an anxiety disorder where it's causing impairment in your life. But schizophrenia uh, is so different from the way we usually view the world and the way we usually think about the world that it is much more difficult to personally understand what it's like, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why it intrigues us so much. Today, as we talk about uh, these disorders, uh, we'll focus primarily on schizophrenia, but my hope is to give you a picture of uh, what it looks like um, for an individual who suffers from it. Let me just give you a brief rundown uh, of the different disorders that we have before I jump into schizophrenia. So these are all the schizophrenia spectrum disorders, so they're all somehow related to schizophrenia. The first is delusional disorder. This is where an individual has just the delusional component of schizophrenia, so they're stuck on an illogical belief, or stuck on this idea that they can't seem to let go. Um, oftentimes with delusional disorder, it's a belief that uh, maybe somebody is out to get them, or maybe a significant other is cheating on them, or things like that. Uh, and it's just kind of taken to the extreme, and even though there's no evidence, or lots of evidence to the contrary, they just view the world in a way that they believe that that must be true. A brief psychotic disorder is the same as schizophrenia, uh, except much shorter in duration. And so we'll talk about schizophrenia and kind of the duration of that a little bit more later. But with a brief psychotic disorder, same symptoms. It's just if those symptoms are present anywhere from one day up till one month, um, then it's a brief psychotic disorder. Um, schizophreniform disorder uh, similar, uh, the major di difference is in duration of the disorder. Here we're seeing the disorder present anywhere from one month up to six months, but looking a lot like schizophrenia. And then finally, schizoaffective disorder. This also looks like schizophrenia, but uh, it's thought to have kind of a different uh, component to it in that major depressive disorder also has to be there. So it's kind of like the schizophrenia is occurring within a depressive episode. Somebody is becoming so depressed uh, that they're having a psychotic break um, and experiencing those symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay, so let's jump into what is actually schizophrenia. What does that disorder look like? We're going to talk about what it looks like, uh, how it develops, or why the disorder is there, as well as how we treat the disorder. What it actually looks like, I want you to think about your perceptions of schizophrenia first. What do you know about schizophrenia, and what sources have influenced your ideas? My guess is your beliefs about schizophrenia probably come from one of two sources. Number one, maybe the media. Uh, you've probably seen it portrayed in movies or on television, um, or perhaps read books, popular books about that disorder. It, it is one of the more popularly portrayed disorders. And number two, perhaps you've seen it actually on the street. Uh, there may have been occasions where you've run into 
maybe a homeless person, and this is typically more in a urban area, metropolitan area, but a homeless person who's uh, maybe in the middle of the street shouting at people <coughs> in a way that doesn't make sense. And uh, yeah, and that might be kind of your, your sources of your knowledge of schizophrenia, but like I said, today I want to give you a much kind of clearer picture of what this disorder is about. So for the disorder, um, there's what we call uh, positive symptoms and negative symptoms associated with it. And positive doesn't mean they're good symptoms. Uh, they're still, you know, very impairing in, in actuality, sometimes the more severe of the symptoms. But positive symptoms are when things are added to the person's perception or experience in life. And so um, delusions would fall into this, where there's a, a belief uh, where um, that they can't let go that is really out of touch with reality. And like I mentioned, uh, common beliefs are people are out to get them. Uh, and it could be like the government, it could be aliens, it could be anything like that. Or another common belief is uh, that a significant other is cheating on them. But it takes the extreme form, uh, often with schizophrenia, where um, it's, it, like I mentioned, out of touch with reality. So, like the government out to get somebody. Well, it's not just somebody's frustrated with their taxes or something like that, but uh, this delusional belief might be that the government has implanted a chip into their brain and is listening to everything that they say and controlling some of their behaviors. Another example of a positive symptom where something is added are hallucinations. And these can just be whenever somebody perceives something to be in the environment that's not actually there. Most common are auditory hallucinations where somebody hears a voice or hears a sound that's not present. But they could also be visual uh, hallucinations where they see something. I worked with a client once uh, and primarily my I've worked with a number of clients with schizophrenia as well I worked on a hospital inpatient unit where people were brought into the hospital uh, usually by the police because they were a danger to others or themselves and uh, probably half the people on the unit had some form of schizophrenia. So an example of the hallucination was a client that I worked with and uh, while I was interviewing her, she saw a dark figure uh, kind of in the upper corner of her room. And it wasn't really a clear object, but she knew that somebody was up there in that corner kind of floating, hovering there in the corner of the room. It really scared her. An example of a delusion, uh, also in the same unit, there was a gentleman that I worked with, uh, and when he was in a psychotic episode, he believed uh, he was a Tinkerbell. And so this was a delusion because he didn't, uh, at these times, like perceive different things in the environment, but he really believed that he was Tinkerbell, and that was his belief, and, and you couldn't change that. Uh, and so he would run around, you know, causing all sorts of problems like he thought Tinkerbell might do. Also with this disorder is uh, oftentimes disorganized speech. Uh, when disorganized speech, I'll give you some examples in a later slide, but uh, it's hard when somebody's in a psychotic episode to really understand what they're saying. It's hard to make sense of their meaning. It, it just doesn't even sound like English. It doesn't follow the rules of English sometimes. Uh, perhaps you can hear words that do make sense or kind of make sense, but uh, you have no idea really what they're getting at. And then we have grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. Um, you'll see this kind of in an individual's grooming and the clothes that they wear um, is the disorganizedness. Uh, you'll see it in kind of their living arrangements, things like that. And cat catatonic behavior uh, also kind of ties into the fifth one, negative symptoms. And this is where we have a reduction. So I mentioned the positive, we have an addition of things to what's actually present in the environment or normal behavior. 
And the negative symptoms in the catatonic behavior is when things are kind of taken away. And so when somebody's in a catatonic state, uh, they may just sit there and it's like they're not even present. Um, they um, don't even move at all, they don't acknowledge you, they just sit there um, zoned out. Uh, also with this kind of a diminished, uh, getting into the negative symptoms, more diminished emotional expression, just loss of self-care, uh, all of those types of things. So you'll notice that uh, that two of these symptoms have to be present for at least a month period. And this is what we call a psychotic episode when these symptoms are present. And usually it has to be either delus delusions or hallucinations have to be there. Uh, but it could be the disorganized speech as well if it's very extreme disorganization to the speech. In addition uh, to this psychotic episode being there for one month, the disturbance has to be there for at least six months. And so these episodes might come and go, or there might be residual symptoms that are longer than that. Uh, but if it's shorter than that six months, then it's back to what we call the schizophreniform disorder, and shorter than the month, a brief psychotic disorder. Um, so when we think about schizophrenia, we really think about it as this long-standing kind of thing. Now, typically, schizophrenia, uh, like I mentioned, a long-standing thing, it typically shows up in an individual's uh, 20s or so, uh, uh, between 20 and 30 uh, years old. It can show up younger. And in fact, I shared with you in a previous lecture uh, when I had to make the diagnostic decision about a, a girl that was only 11 years old that was displaying all of these signs of schizophrenia. Most often it's in the 20s when somebody actually starts to interact with stressors more in their environment. They're kind of on their own and independent to uh, face those stressors. Uh, some of these uh, uh, things that we talked about before. Uh, so uh, the first two that I mentioned, hallucinations and delusions, these really represent a loss of contact with reality. The delusions, I mentioned a few, um, uh, persecution is one. Somebody is persecuting the individual. Another common theme to the delusions are delusions of reference where uh, there's um, some type of a specialness or importance to the individual. Uh, and somebody is like communicating to them uh, in some way. And so uh, oftentimes individuals with schizophrenia uh, with this type of delusion may uh, watch a TV show and feel like there's special messages sent just to them, or be listening to the radio and uh, hear a message over it um, that has special reference to them. Another common area is grandeur, uh, that um, uh, not only are they, you know, have some type of message being sent to them, but uh, somehow they're kind of all important. One of the most common things uh, for individuals with this disorder is to believe uh, that they are Jesus Christ. And that's an actual belief that they have um, and uh, act on um, when they're in a psychotic episode. And then finally, control. Uh, some individuals believe, and this all kind of ties in together, but somehow that they control the fate of the universe. Uh, that if they do the wrong thing, uh, that um, the whole universe is going to explode, or uh, the world, or whatever. It doesn't always have to be the universe, but somehow they're in control of what happens uh, around them, beyond what anybody uh, would actually believe they have control over. And then into the hallucinations, I mentioned that can be any of the senses. Most common is auditory, followed by visual hallucinations. Uh, but individuals can have tactile uh, sensory hallucinations where 
and maybe they feel something on them and they actually feel that it's there um, as well as a set a sense of smell um, that they smell something that's not actually there it's interesting that sometimes with the smell when individuals can uh, say that they smell uh, a year or smell a color or uh, smell things that don't have a smell to them. Um, now you do have to be careful with this one. There is uh, some uh, brain injuries that can actually, uh, because of damage in the brain, cause smell uh, sensations associated with other things like that. But uh, here it's in the absence of that kind of trauma to the brain. think a little bit more about the hallucinations and auditory hallucinations in particular and so to have you think about this what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you try to solve this logic problem and while you try to solve the logic problem and I'll give you like three minutes or so to read through what's on this slide and see if you can come up with the answer while you try to solve it I'm going to play uh, what people think auditory hallucinations are like for an individual uh, who hears them. And so this is what would be playing in their head while they're, say, trying to do their schoolwork or whatever it might be. Yes, <laughs> 
Okay. So, as you listen to that, you probably had a difficult time concentrating on the logic problem. And my guess is, uh, I couldn't come up with an answer if you, you know, uh, fully listened to that audio while you were trying to do it. And like I mentioned, this is what individuals with schizophrenia, what it's thought that they experience in their head uh, nonstop. Uh, that they hear this voice or voices that are telling them these things. And you can imagine how difficult it would be for an individual to, uh, say, do well in school or uh, do their job well or even have a relationship with somebody else if that's what they're constantly hearing. Now these hallucinations can take different forms, sometimes like this where it's constantly sending the message to them here the, the voice was constantly telling the person that they're stupid, uh, that they're worthless, things like that. But other times the voice can more, be more of a command uh, presence to it, where the individual is told to do something, uh, told to uh, jump off a building, told to go kill somebody, told to steal something. And if you constantly had that playing over and over in your head, then you can see how hard it would be to function in life. Now these individuals too, you know, as you heard this and you worked on it, you can make sense of it. You could say, okay, that's, that's auditory coming out of the computer. You know, there's a source to that. Uh, but these individuals uh, don't just see these voices as going on in their head. And they see them as actual voices talking to them. And so they're real. They can't just discount it, uh, but it's there and present for them. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the mental disorganization with the, the schizophrenia and how difficult it is to talk to somebody when they're experiencing a psychotic break. And here's some examples of it. Um, um, and so I'll just read a couple of these. So uh, the first one in the top left is what we call neologisms. And so an individual with schizophrenia might say, and it is no mental disturbance or putinance. It is an amoration law. There is nothing to disturb me. It's like their privatolinemia, and the children have to have this accentuative law so they don't go to the mortative law of the church. So neologisms is when an individual makes up words. Uh, several of those words, they don't have a real meaning. They sound like they could be words, but, uh, but they're not actual words. The second pattern that you sometimes hear in the speech and thought of individuals with schizophrenia, uh, perseveration. And so I'll read it. Yes, I mean error. I mean, you are from London. I mean, do you like London, particularly of London? I think that London is wild buses, wild buses in London, and wild trains underground is wild in London. Bus, I mean, it is Lebanon bus of London and Lebanon train of London. And so you can hear they're stuck on words. They're stuck on these ideas, and they can't move past them, so their sentences don't make sense at all. Another one is something we call clang, where there's kind of a rhyming, uh, and so their sentence isn't about making sense, it's more about uh, this rhyming to it. And so we have the smaller two boxes are examples of that. When asked about the weather, so hot you know it runs on a cot. Okay, so that doesn't make sense, but it has this clang, this rhyme to it. Or the bottom one. I said the bread and read the shed and fed Ned at the head. Again, rhyming. Sounds kind of like Dr. Seuss, except at least when you read Dr. Seuss' book, it, it kind of makes sense. There's some story to those uh, books, but here it's not clear at all what that, that is supposed to be saying. Uh, but to an individual with schizophrenia, it's clear to them, and, and they just talk to you like uh, you should understand it. And it can be frustrating for them when you don't. Finally, the last kind of category of uh, disorganized thought and speech are loose associations. 
And so we have the kind of question answer uh, example there. The question asked to an individual with loose associations. Have you been nervous lately? No, I got a head of lettuce. What do you mean? Well, lettuce is a transformation of a dead cougar that stuffed a relapse on the lion's toe. And he swallowed the lion and something happened. The, see, the Glorian Tommy. They're two heads and they've got no whales. Uh, but they escaped with herds of vomit and things like that. So you can see loose associations that's jumping around uh, from one thing to the next and it doesn't make sense. Uh, and maybe uh, a jump from one thing to the other, you might be able to see a little bit of connection there. So being nervous to something about head and then head to head of lettuce, uh, but uh, it really, as you put it all together, just no idea what's going on. The last one, this was a client when asked about itchy arms. And they said, the problem is insects. My brother used to collect insects. He is a man, five feet, ten inches, you know. Ten is my favorite number. I also like to dance, draw, and watch TV. Again, one thing kind of connects to the other, but when you put it all together, you have no idea. Uh, what's being said and didn't answer the question at all. The disturbance of behavior and emotions. So these were the symptoms. Uh, could be the catatonic symptoms, could be the disorganized symptoms, oftentimes maybe aggression, or a kind of incongruence between what they're saying and what they're doing. And so things like poor hygiene is often seen with individuals with schizophrenia, an unpredictable emotional response to things, bizarre clothing, non-purposeful behavior, uh, lack of impulse control, and kind of decline in daily functioning. Now any one of these things alone, we wouldn't say somebody's schizophrenic. Uh, if they have unpredict unpredictable emotional responses, well we know that's present with lots of different disorders. But when it's paired with the disorganized thought and, and paired with those delusions or hallucinations, uh, that's when we're seeing the schizophrenic uh, picture. Mm -hmm. Symptoms of schizophrenia, and you can see how they then fit in with those kind of three main content areas. The loss of contact with reality, the delusions and hallucinations, the mental disorganization being the disorganized thought, speech, kind of breakdown in their ability to pay attention to the world, that they just aren't in their head, aren't putting things together in a logical way that uh, is normal. Um, and then finally, the disturbance in behavior and emotions. And like I mentioned before, positive and negative kind of symptoms, uh, oftentimes we group kind of the disorganized symptoms in, in with the positive, but there could be kind of, yeah, we could keep it separate as well, this disorganized component. Well, but uh, at some point, uh, I uploaded a great talk on schizophrenia by Ellen Sachs. Uh, it's on Moodle. It's a TED Talk. The link I have on this slide doesn't go to the talk anymore, but the one I have posted on Moodle does. And Ellen Sachs, uh, a very interesting talk because she's an individual who has lived with schizophrenia. Uh, she's a, a psychologist, uh, works, you know, studies this disorder, and one of the authoritative persons with this disorder, uh, on this disorder, uh, that uh, she's lived through it. Um, starting when she was in grad school and she shares about some of her experiences in that talk. So very interesting. Make sure you watch it. How does this develop in people? It works on uh, back to what we call the diathesis stress model. And remember with the diathesis stress model there's kind of multiple levels. There's the level that puts somebody at a vulnerability uh, for the disorder, but then there has to be a stressor present that then results in the schizophrenia developing. So let's talk about some of that vulnerability first. Uh, some of the vulnerability comes from our, from our inherited factors. The way our brain forms. 
we know that schizophrenia, is, there's a high genetic component to it. If you have an identical twin who has schizophrenia, remember you share 100% of your genes with that identical twin. And so there's 48% chance that you'll also have schizophrenia. Now that shows a genetic component uh, because if it's fraternal twins who just share the same environment but don't share as much of the same genes, the percent likelihood is much lower, only 17%. But it also shows that genes don't explain everything. Even though there's 100% overlap in genes, it's not 100% overlap uh, in um, having the disorder. And then you can see uh, some of the brain's uh, pictures there and kind of uh, differences between individuals with schizophrenia and without schizophrenia. Uh, you see in this picture kind of lower level of activation um, in uh, that uh, back portion of the brain. And I, I, if you remember back to, I think it was the second lecture that we did, kind of the larger ventricles that are uh, seen, uh, the kind of empty spaces in the brain seen with individuals with schizophrenia. Inherited factors, but there's also early uh, factors uh, that can happen to an individual that would uh, make them more vulnerable to schizophrenia. Uh, one of those, uh, or some of them, can happen prenatally uh, while the child is in the womb. Uh, it could be prenatal exposure to a viral infection, prenatal exposure to stress, or even low oxygen levels during birth. And now that these these can be very common things, so it's not everybody that has these things goes on to develop schizophrenia, but there is an association. Those with schizophrenia often have had uh, uh, some experience with that. There's a correlation there. They can also be postnatal things, things that happen when the individual uh, is growing up and they're a young child. And again, uh, early exposure to viruses. Now, every child gets sick, so it's not something you can necessarily uh, prevent, but when there's early major exposure, uh, then that sometimes is seen with schizophrenia. And again, that's correlational, uh, so you don't have to worry and make sure your child never gets sick, but um, um, yeah, there's some theory that um, those with schizophrenia had had some major uh, virus exposure in childhood. Also, we often see there being a physical or sexual abuse in childhood. Again, that's not always, uh, it's not a 100% guarantee, but usually or um, often individuals with schizophrenia have been physically or sexually abused in childhood. And then as well, frequent social stress or isolation in childhood and then frequent kind of overall family stress um, is seen in individuals. Now again, we don't know what, what causes what. Um, individuals who have schizophrenia, even though it's a disorder that develops much later in life, and they may start to show signs of it very early on in childhood. And those early signs may end up leading to, say, the social isolation or the social stress or some of the family stressors that are there. So we don't know the direction of these things, just that... Okay, so it's taken together though. Like I mentioned, those prenatal events and those postnatal events, many people will experience those, but they won't ever develop schizophrenia. And so here's where we uh, combine it with the inherited factors. Both have to be present. Um, it can't just be those uh, prenatal or postnatal events. Now, both of them present uh, alone also doesn't guarantee schizophrenia, but it leads to a vulnerability. And so there needs to be some type of stress at some point, some type of stressor at some point uh, before the disorder actually comes out. And that can be uh, major events, those major kind of uh, traumatic events, or it can be more minor things, just the stress of being out um, kind of on your own, being out and 
making those hard decisions in life uh, can be very stressful and, and can uh, kind of start the onset of the disorder. Um, another example of these stressors could be uh, substance use, uh, particularly hallucinogens. Um, um, one of uh, the kind of uh, well-known or more commonly known examples of this is um, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. And there was a recent movie uh, that came out. Um, I can't remember what it was called now. Uh, maybe it was like Love and Music or uh, something like that. That was about his life. And, uh, and it, it, he had schizophrenia. And this kind of documents the course of that disorder for him and uh, shows how uh, it was possibly tied to the drug use. Now again, the drug use alone, there's plenty of people who use uh, um, drugs that uh, cause hallucinations or uh, things like that in the short term as an effect of the drug. That's not going to guarantee that the individual is going to get schizophrenia. They have to have had those inherited factors there. They have to have that genetic predisposition, and uh, as well as some of those acquired factors, those prenatal or postnatal events. So the vulnerability has to be there first uh, for it to actually happen. Today, just on treatments. As we jump into treatments, I do want to say that in our history, we have not treated this disorder very well. And that's perhaps because we didn't understand it. Um, uh, we didn't understand what was going on for individuals with schizophrenia. And so, for example, some of the pictures I have up here uh, previously, you know, schizophrenia was seen as somebody being possessed by devils. And so their treatment might be locked away in a church asylum where a priest would come and do exorcisms and if those didn't work then the individual might be you know burned or killed in some way uh, uh, fast forward a little bit you know uh, people started to with schizophrenia started to be uh, locked up in in various asylums not necessarily religious related uh, but kind of state-run uh, hospitals where they'd be locked up and because the disorders weren't understand, the treatments in those uh, facilities were similarly very, very poor. And so you see the next picture is an example of a former treatment that they used where uh, they'd have the individual with schizophrenia sit in a chair and then they'd spin them. And the idea was that the schizophrenia was a result of their body fluids and everything somehow being out of balance. And so they'd spin them to try to rebalance all of those fluids. And um, you can see a sitting down version or a laying down version. Uh, but as you think about it today, you wonder how would that possibly uh, ever help somebody who has schizophrenia? Uh, wouldn't it just make things worse? You can also see historically, you know, they would uh, lock up individuals uh, because they were at danger. Uh, to others. And so you see a bed there that historically was used in some of those hospitals to uh, keep them under control. Uh, again, you think, well, wouldn't that just make the, the symptoms and the problems worse for the individual? Now, uh, oftentimes in the past and actually still currently today, individuals with schizophrenia uh, would often be, just be found on the street uh, rather than even receiving any form of treatment and they were kind of just the outcast of society and it's estimated today that a large portion of the homeless population uh, experience uh, some type of psychotic disorder um, and so it makes you wonder uh, is our approach today uh, all that better and finally even more recently uh, kind of a picture of individuals in straight jackets. If you watch that video, Alan Sachs talks about straight jackets and kind of the experience of being in one and, and what that does to an individual. And um, 
uh, again, wondering, you know, does this possibly make things worse? And in that picture in particular, uh, these individuals are prison inmates. And many individuals with schizophrenia, rather than actually getting effective treatment, um, end up getting sent to jail. They do something, they act out on their hallucinations and delusions in some way and, and get in trouble for it. Um, and so a number of individuals in our uh, prison settings uh, have this disorder even today. And we are, there's movement to get better at identifying, you know, when is it something like schizophrenia and, and getting them to an appropriate treatment setting uh, rather than being incarcerated. Current approaches for schizophrenia. Medication is uh, kind of an essential component to it. It's not like depression or a lot of the anxiety disorders where uh, medication is kind of an optional second line treatment. Psychotherapy should be done first. Here with schizophrenia, medication is considered definitely the first line treatment. And the type of medication is a class of medications called antipsychotics. Many times, uh, individuals with schizophrenia will have a mixture of these antipsychotics that they take. It's not just one. Uh, but what they're thought to do is really put uh, the positive symptoms more under control. Uh, kind of make it so the individual uh, is able to recognize them a little better, be able to see where they're coming from better, and they're not so extreme or present in the individual's life. But these uh, are also very heavy kind of tranquilizers where the individual experiences overall kind of dulling in their life, dulling to their affect, dulling to their kind of creativity, their thought processes, uh, really kind of a heavy influence on them. And so it's a difficult medication to take, but a difficult situation to be in because if the medication is taken, they often have major side effects, but if they're not taken, uh, then the disorder can have even bigger impairments on the individual's life. And if, you, uh, if you've seen it or haven't ever seen it before, the movie A Beautiful Mind uh, talks about, uh, tells the story of John Nash, and a very brilliant kind of scientist, economics, uh, uh, won a Nobel Prize for his work, but he suffered from schizophrenia. And in the movie, it shows some of his struggles with the medication. So I'd encourage you to, if you've seen it, uh, watch it again. Or if you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, good movie. Okay. In addition to the medication, though, it's important that individuals with schizophrenia are in a supportive environment. When an individual is in a more active psychotic episode, Oftentimes, the individual, the supportive environment is an inpatient hospital, a uh, setting that's more under control, uh, where the situation is set up so they're less likely to be a danger to themselves or others. But the way inpatient hospitals work now is uh, the field tries to keep people in those settings as short of time as ho possible. Uh, recognition that you can't just there, there's not going to be a good long-term outcome if somebody lives in that type of setting for years on end. They're not going to know how to reintegrate with the society. And so typically an inpatient hospital stay might be somewhere between two weeks to two months, longest maybe a year, uh, but the idea is really to get the person stabilized. And then after they're stabilized, then uh, treatment often moves into uh, a very still strong social support, but they're halfway kind of still in the environment. And so that's things like day hospitals and group homes. In day hospitals, the individuals uh, will go to the day hospital early in the morning and they'll spend the day receiving various treatments and having their meals and, and things like that at the hospital setting, um, but then return home and spend the time with their family. And one of the most kind of famous of the day hospitals, several kind of movies or books have been portrayed about it, uh, is McLean Hospital. And you can, it's in Massachusetts, Boston area. You can check it up and look at some of the history uh, behind uh, day hospitals and that hospital in particular. But uh, even though it has kind of a checkered past, uh, that hospital 
uh, is one of the best treatment facilities, kind of top-notch place uh, in terms of treating schizophrenia and some of the more severe uh, psychopathology. And finally, family support is a big component in treatment for schizophrenia. Uh, individuals with schizophrenia uh, may not ever uh, be at the point where they can fully live on their own. And so it, that extra level of support, uh, whether it's in a group home or in their family setting is needed. So family setting, it may be parents or siblings who uh, are there with the individual and can monitor their medication and help them do things like buy groceries, stuff like that. Now, uh, the other option is group homes where there's a, a hired person, the individual lives, say, in an apartment uh, and lives in that apartment with uh, other individuals who might have similar disorders. Uh, but then there's staff there, uh, the landlord and the helpers kind of in that home who are there to regularly help with the medication, help with the meals, things like that. And so giving them uh, opportunity to be in the real world, you know, and, and that group home setting might help facilitate them finding jobs, things like that, uh, but still having the support, uh, a constant support for them. Um, now, uh, the level of care that's needed isn't always the same for everyone. Like I mentioned before, that uh, a lot of these treatments are for the more severe uh, versions of schizophrenia. The earlier the disorder is detected, uh, the kind of less severe it is and the more positive prognostic uh, uh, kind of outcomes that are available. Um, uh, so. Uh, some individuals with schizophrenia are able to fully integrate back into their environment. Um, uh, but then others, when it's been present for a long time, uh, it, it, you may not ever see kind of full um, recovery from this disorder. And finally, psychotherapy does play a component in the treatment of schizophrenia. And, and there has been some research that psychotherapy uh, um, alone can be effective, but, uh, but preliminary research. Uh, right now, really, um, psychotherapy is used as an adjunct treatment in combination with the medication. And so in thinking about psychotherapy, you know, cognitive therapy, uh, really helping the individual evaluate their thinking patterns and helping the individual learn how to test reality um, has been shown to be helpful. And then insight-focused psychotherapy, where uh, the individual focuses on gaining more insight into their abuse, uh, trauma histories that they've had. And so at this point, I want to give you the code word for today. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's do NASH uh, for John Nash, the uh, economist who had schizophrenia. So if you type in NASH, uh, into Moodle uh, for the credit spot and you'll get credit for this week's lecture. Ellen Sachs video that I mentioned uh, watching on Moodle, make sure to watch the crash course video that I have on schizophrenia posted on Moodle. It will give you a good summary of what we talked about today in the lecture but also uh, what's covered in the book with this disorder.